two. It was somewhere about eight o'clock when de Grandin returned to my house. Bonsoir, docteur. Laden with almost enough bundles to tax a motor track's capacity. Great Scott, professor, I exclaimed as he laid his parcels on a convenient chair, and gave me a grin which sent the waxed points of his mustache shooting upward like a miniature pair of horns. Have you been buying out the town? Almost. He admitted as he seated himself and lit a vile-smelling French cigarette. I have told the mosh with the grosser, the drugist, the garage keeper and the tobacconist, and at each place I make purchase. I am, for that time, a new resident of your so place en suburb, anxious to find out about my neighbors and my new home. I have talk, talk, talk. I have milled over much wordy chaff, hélas, but from it I have extracted some good meal, grâce à Dieu. He fixed his curiously unwinking cat stare on me and asked, You have a Monsieur Calmar resident here, have you no? Yes, I replied, I believe we have. And you can tell me of him, he paused, raising eyebrows questioningly. No, I answered, I'm afraid I can't. He's lived here about a year, and kept very much to himself. As far as I know, he has made friends with no one in the village, and has been visited by no one but the tradesmen. I've been given to understand he is a scientist of some sort, and took the old means place, out on the Andover Road, so he could pursue his experiments in quiet. Ah, yes, I see. De Grandin tapped his cigarette case thoughtfully with his fingertips. That much I have already got read from my talk this day. Now tell me, if you can, is this monsieur, all unknown, a friend of the young man Liz, the gentleman who's won from gunshot you treated this morning? Not that I know, I replied. I've never seen them together. Manly is a queer, moody sort of chap, never has much to say to anyone. How Millicent Comstock came to fall in love with him I've no idea. He rides well, and is highly thought of by her mother, but those are about the only qualifications he has as a husband, that I've been able to see. It is very strong, no? De Grandin queried. I don't know, I had to confess. Well, then, he returned, listen at me. You think De Grandin is a fool? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. This day I make other business beside the talk. I go to that Comstock lady's house and reconnoiter. In Ashkan I find one pair of paz leather dress shoes, much scratched. I gaze the palm of a servant, and find out they are that Monsieur Manlis. I also look farty and find one white in dress shirt, with blood on it. This tom about the cuffs and split at the shoulder, that shirt. It, too, I find, belong to Monsieur Manly. I am like a Jewish second on man when I talk with that servant of Madame Comstock, I buy from him that shirt and those shoes. Bold. Undoing a parcel, he exhibited a pair of dress shoes and a shirt, as though they were curios of priceless value. In Paris, we have way of making the inanima talk, he asserted as he thrust his hand into his pocket and drew forth a bit of folded paper. That shirt and those shoes I put trop de third degree, and I find this. Opening the paper he disclosed three coarse, dull brown hairs, varying from a half inch to three inches in length. I examined them curiously. It have been from a man's head, for they were too long and insufficiently curved to be body hairs. But their texture seemed too harsh for human growth. Um, I commented non-commit tally. Um, he mocked. You can all classify them, eh? No, no, I admitted. They are entirely too coarse to have come from Manley's head. Beside, they are almost black. His hair is a distinct brown. My friend, de Grandin leaned forward suddenly, staring me straight in the eyes. Those air, I have seen such before. So have you, but you do not recognize. They are from a gorilla. Impossible. How could a gorilla's hair get on Manley's shirt? Not on, he corrected, still gazing directly at me. They were in it, below the neckline, where a bullet had torn through the linen and wounded him. The air were embedded in the doctor's eye de blood. Look at this garm. He held the shirt before me for inspection. Behold, how it is split. It has been upon a body too big for it. Monsieur Trowbridge, that shirt was worn by that thing, the monster, which killed that pitiful girl dead, on the lynx last night, which attacked the young Meland a few minutes later. And which got this paint from the side of Madame Constock house on these shoes, when it claimed it that house last night. You start, you stare, you say to yourself, de Grandin, he is Kedzuk, 
Mad, listen, I prove each step on the ladder, this morning, while you examine Monsieur Manley Swand, I examine him, and his home. On his window see, I note a few scripts, such scripts, as one would drag his legs and feet might make ca aiming over the window ledge. I look out at the window, and on the white painted side of the house I find fresh paint scratch. Two, also, I find marks on the painted iron pipe which carry the water from the roof, door on rainy weather. The pipe run down the corner of the house, near manless window, but too far away for a man to reach it from the sea. But if that man have arms, along a my leg, what then? Ah, he could make the rich most easy. Now, when I buy these shoes, that shirt, from the Comstock servant, I note the paint on the show, and the scratch also terrain. I compare the paint on the show with the paint on the other side. They are the same. I note that shirt, how there are blood stand, how we are all burst, I took the man who were in suddenly grow grip and break him out. I find the beast air in the blood stain on the shirt. I take that shirt to the laundry, and ask the excellent chinois, who shirt are this? He reply, not now. I say, you are lear, but I give you this, I show him a bee of ten dollar, to tell the truth. He take my bee, and smile like summer, as a repeal I, Mr. Manless. Voila. You see? No, I'll be hanged if I do, I denied. He bent forward again, speaking with rapid earnestness, that servant, he tell me more. Last night the young Molly was nervous, what you call he at ease. A complaint of edic, of bakic, a feel rotten. A go to bed early, and is a mouse, she go without him to the country club dance. The old madame, she, too, go to bed. The young man, he go for walk, because he can sleep, he tell that servant dead this morning. But the servant, he was sup, with the tutic all night, and while he hear the young man come in after midnight, he did not hear him leave. Now, what you think? Policeman of the motorcycle, tell me he see the young Molly, come from that Monsieur Calmares house, staggering like one drunk. He wonder, that policeman, if Monsieur Calmar, keep so much to himself because he hear a lecky of the boot, eh? What now, cher doctor? You say what? Damn it! Exploded, you piecing out the silliest nonsense story I ever heard, de Grandin. One of us is crazy as hell, and I don't think it's I. Neter of us is crazy, mon vieux, he returned gravely, but men have gone mad with knowing what I know, and mad there, yet we suspect what I, I am beginning to suspect. Will you drive me past the house of Monsieur Calmar? A few minutes run carried us out to the lonely house occupied by the eccentric old man whose year's residence near the village had been a 12 months mystery. Ah, ah, de Grandin exclaimed as we passed the place, he works la e, this one. Observe, the light burns in his workshop. Sure enough, from a window at the rear of the house a shaft of electric light cut the evening shadows, and, as we stopped the car and gazed, we could see Kalmar's bent form swathed in a laboratory apron, passing and repassing the window as he shuffled nervously back and forth across the room. At Osgore, de Grandin suggested, turning from his silent contemplation of the worker. While we drive back, I will tell you a story. Before the war, which ragged the world, there came to Paris, from the University of Vienna one Dr. Benekendorf. As a man he was intolerable, as a scholar he was incomparable. A knowledge of the greatest savant, concerning organic evolution and comparative anatomy, were but a children s a, b, c to that one. With my own two eyes I have seen him perform experiments which, on an age less tolerant of learning, perhaps in your own America. With T.S. so curious laws against the teaching of science Steve Kutros, would have brought him to the stake as a wizard. But science is God tool, my friend, 
and it is not meant that man should play at being God. That man, he went too far. We ought to restrain him in prison. Yes? I answered, not particularly interested in the narrative. What did he do? He, what did he not do? De Grandin replied. She then of the power found missing at night. They were nowhere. The gendarme searched narrowly to the laboratory of this Benekendorf, and there they found no the poor infant, but a half score of a creature, not wally human, not wally simian. But partaking horribly of the appearance of each, with fur and and like feet, but with the face of something which had once been of mankind. They were dead, those poor ones, fortunately for them. A prof de mad, like the bug of June, as you Americans say, but ah, my friend, what a mentality, what a fine brain gone bad. We shut him up for the safety of the public, and for the safety of the race, we burned his notebooks and destroyed the serum, with which he had injected the human babes to turn them into a ape. Impossible, I exclaimed. Incredible, yes, the grand in admitted, but not, unfortunately, impossible for him. He secret entered the mad house with him, but in the turbulent days of war, when the bush under the at the gates of Paris, he escaped. Good God, I, I cried. You mean to say, the Gratidin, this mad fiend, this maker of monsters, is loose on the world? He shrugged his shoulders with Gallic fatalism. Perhaps. All trace of him has vanished, to their aeroport, he was later seen on the Congo Belgique. But, ah, no, I ramble on like a fool. Of what connection is this remembrance of my own with the case of Sarah Humphries? Pardieu, none. One favor, monsieur, if you please, let me accompany you once more, when you attend a young manly. World have a one minute talk with Madame Comstock. Perhaps. His voice trailed off into silence. Mrs. Cornelia Comstock was a lady of imposing physique and even more imposing manner. She was willing to receive respectful and ceremonious consideration from society reporters, her fellow club members, even from solicitors for causes. To de Grandin, she was simply a woman who had information which he desired. Prefacing his inquiry with the sort of bow none but a Frenchman can achieve, he began directly. Madame Comstock, do you, or did you ever, no one Dr. Benekendorf? Mrs. Comstock, who was used to dominating her husband, her daughter and all mankind in general, drew herself stiffly erect and directed a withering gaze at him. My good man, she began, as though he were an overcharging taxi driver, but the Frenchman met her cold eyes, with eyes equally cold and uncompromising. You will answer my question, please, he told her. Pray Marie, I represent the Republic of France, but I also represent humanity. What's more, please, did you ever know a Dr. Benekendorf? Mrs. Comstock's imperious glance lowered before de Grandin's unwinking stare, and her thin lips twitched slightly as she replied, Yes. Ah, we make progress. When did you know him? In what circumstance? Believe me, you may speak in confidence before me and Dr. Trowbridge, but please to speak frankly. The importance is great. I knew Otto Benekendorf many years ago. The lady answered in a low voice. He had just come to this country from Europe, and was teaching science at the university near which I lived as a girl. We, we were engaged. Ah, uh, so, and your betrothal was broken? For what reason, please? Looking at her, I could scarcely recognize the community's social dictator in Mrs. Cornelia Comstock as she regarded de Grandin with wondering, frightened eyes. She shivered, as though she felt a sudden draft of chilled air, before answering. He, he was impossible. Sir, we had vivisectionists, even in those days, but this man seemed to torture poor, helpless animals for the love of it. I gave him back his ring when he boasted of one of his experiments to me. He seemed to enjoy telling how the poor beast suffered before it died. Eh, bien, de Grandin shot me a meaning glance, as though I, too, followed the thread his examination unraveled. We do progress. Bon, your betrothal, then, was broken. He left to you. This so cruel experimentaire. Did 
Even friendship, he leaned forward, waxed cat mustache bristling, as he waited her reply in breathless eagerness. Mrs. Comstock looked like one on the verge of fainting as she almost whispered, No, no, he left me with a terrible threat. I remember his very words, can I ever forget them? He said, I go from you, but I shall return. Nothing but death can cheat me. I shall bring on you and yours a horror such as no man has known since the days before Adam. The grand almost danced as she finished speaking. Ah, ah, it, he exclaimed, the explanation is ours. The mystery is almost solved. Merci, madame. If you will, tell me one more little thing, I shall retire and trouble you no more. Your daughter, she is betrothed to one, Monsieur Marley. Tell me, I beg, when and where did she meet this young man? I introduced them, the lady replied with a return of something of her frigid manner. Mr. Manley came to my husband with letters of introduction from an old schoolmate of his, a fellow student at the university, in Cape Town. Eh? Hey, de Grandin almost shrieked. On, do you say? Cape Town, South Africa. Non, a petit, bon ami from Cape Town. When was this, madame, please? A year ago. Why? And Monsieur Manley, he has lived with you how long? The question shut off her offended protest half-uttered. Mr. Manley is stopping with us, she answered icily. He is to marry my daughter, Millicent, next month. Really, sir, I failed to see what interest the Republic of France, which you represent, and humanity, which you also claim to represent, can have in my private affairs. If... And this kept on fra, the Grandet interrupted feverishly. Tell me, his name was what, and his business? I... Tell me, he cried impatiently, extending his slender hands as though to choke the answer from her. No, don't fussy. I must know, at once. We do not know his street and number, Mrs. Comstock replied. His name is Alexander Findlay, and he is a diamond factor. Ah, ah, yeah. Merci, madame. You have been most kind, said de Grandin, and he struck his heels together and bowed as though hinged at the hips. Tea was past midnight when the phone rang insistently. Hello? Western Union speaking. A girl's voice announced over the wire. Cablegram for Dr. de Grandin. Ready? Yes, I answered, seizing the pencil and pad beside the instrument. No person by name Alexander Findlay Diamond Factor known here. No record of such person in last five years. Signed, Berlin Game, Inspector of Police. The cable is from Cape Town, South Africa. She added as I finished jotting down her dictation. Very good, I replied. Forward a typed confirmation in the morning, please. Then I went to the Grandin's room with the message. Millionaire, he shouted, flinging the covers back, as I read him the cablegram. No person by name Alexander Findlay Diamond Fact, no record of such person in last five years. Inspector of Police, from Cape Town, South Africa. De Grandin, et il se foule, hein? Listen, he leaped from the bed and raced across the room to where his coat hung over a chair. Extracting a black leather notebook, almost as large as a desk dictionary, he thumbed its pages rapidly. Finally found the entry he sought. Beard. This Monsieur Calmar, whom no one knows about, he have left her ten months and twenty six days. I have it from that, so stupid real estate broker, who think I ask information for a directory of CNTS. That young Monsieur Manly, he have known those constock for about a year. He bring them a letter of introduction from a schoolmate of Monsieur Comstock, who are unknown to the captain police. But you, after Jules de Grandin, he sleep all day and prowl all night. Tomorrow, Monsieur, you shall introduce me to the gun merchant. I this year to possess one Winchester a rifle.